to four. Organization. Do you have a gardening problem? We can help you with that. A program dedicated to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make that grass look a little bit greener, as well as preserving what you grow. We're here to help you with your gardening problem. You're tuned in to Garden Talk Radio. You're listening to the most informational packed hour of Garden Focus Radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging projects. Visit PowerPlanter. Dot com. We want to thank you for taking time out of your day to join us to talk gardening for the next hour. Whether you're listening to us through one of the 16 radio stations that is broadcasting our program here in 2020, through a radio app, through our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com, uh, under the season four tab at the top of the page, uh, in, uh, podcast replay or in studio video replay. We thank you very much for that. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, to make your trees look greener and your grass to grow stronger indoors and out, as well as preserving what you grow. There's a couple of ways in which you can get a hold of us if you'd like to talk to us. You can give us a call right now at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-SHOW. If we can't get through to you, uh, from you to us, leave a message and we will call you back. If you would rather send us an email, you can do that at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That will get you right to us. We've got a big program lined up for you today. We're going to talk about in segment one, overwintering annuals. Uh, vegetables and how you can do such so you can get more out of it as well as in the second segment we're going to talk about amending your soil yes it's spring but it is time to or it is fall but it's time to start thinking about spring next year and what you can do to get the soil ready if it's not up to par as well as our guest will be seed expert ben coney will be with us plus your garden questions so how let's get into the program and discuss pr- uh, annual vegetables and how we can overwinter them and, and maybe bringing them in or leaving them in the garden and using protection to keep them like a refrigerator out there, but not frozen. Okay. So one plant that you can actually overwinter indoors and is a good idea if maybe you grow some, some specific pepper plants. So if you are like, this is my, I don't know, ghost pepper or habanero or whatever, you can overwinter. Now, overwintering them does not mean that it's going to be successful. You and I tried it once with yeah. one pepper. We were not successful. We, we didn't but do with hot peppers. Hot peppers seem, they, it is found to be hot peppers seem to be a little more tolerable over the overwintering process than a mild pepper for whatever reason. But I think if you have the space, you should just give it a try. And when we're talking about overwintering, we're talking about you can do two different things here. We can bring them in. Put them next to a nice sunny window and keep them green foliage alive and or under a happy leaf LED grow light, something like that. Or we can go to the realm of putting them in a closet and basically making them go dormant to essentially. It's not, uh, it's uh, not a closet. Um, re- so re- Reducing light. Right, reducing light. So there's a process here. So first you want to make sure you spray the plant off. Um, you yeah, want last to- thing you want is additional animals and insects that are going to live with you. Yeah. Until you move. So you want to dig it up and then you want to put it in a five gallon bucket with some similar soil. Now, what if we've already got it in a container on the porch patio or deck? Can we just bring it in? We still need to rinse it off. You want to rinse it off and then probably if you can leave it in like a hallway or something, a breezeway, some, you know, for a couple of days, just in case. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Um, so you spray the plant off, make sure it's kind of adjusted to the inside world. Uh, put a five gallon bucket of soil in there. And then you're going to place in a cool, semi-dark place, like a basement or an attached garage, something like that. And what's going to happen is that um, it's, the leaves will the leaves will die back and fall off, and that's what you want. And you only want to water it every three to four weeks during this process. And once the leaves start to fall back, 
or die off, you want to um, prune the plant. So you just basically tr- trim it back so there's just a bunch of Y-shaped branches, about two to three inches in length of those those Y-shaped branches. Then about a month before your last frost date, you're going to bring your pepper plant out of the cool location and move it to a brighter, warmer location. All right. And you could even do like near the happy leaf glow, grow light. Um, and then you do that for about a month. You could use a heating pad and then you want to resume watering at the normal rate, but just kind of increase it during that month. So whenever it's in its semi-dark area, you were not watering it or are we watering or what's, what's the status there on the... Every three to four weeks. Okay. So you kind of want to keep moisture to it, but you don't want it to dry out, but you also don't want too much moisture. Otherwise, it's going to try to start growing again, and that's not what you want. Right, exactly. So I think it's worth a try, especially if you are growing these specialty hot peppers, and um, it's not a bad idea. No, and it's a lot more. We, we kind of gave you the, the, the gist of the, enough information to get you going. There is some uh, good articles out there on how you can can do this in There's much more in depth yeah, than yeah. what we're able to cover in just a short period of time. Uh, what we want broccoli uh, can be planted early in the uh, spring, as well as uh, <clears throat> in the fall, and you can overwinter that to a certain degree. Right. So it can ham- handle temperatures about from a down to twenty six to thirty one degrees um, Fahrenheit. So it's not, you're not necessarily overwintering it, but if you live in an area where maybe it doesn't get that cool, that's something that you could possibly grow and maintain throughout winter. All right. Brussels sprouts Brussels is another one. Spru- yeah. So those are another one. Um, and same. cabbage are all kind of in the same family. They're all brassicas, so they can all kind of be similar in conditional requirements to long get more longevity out of them right and brussels sprouts um so once you leave them out in the cool weather they can they can go down to as low as 26 degrees and once you leave them out in the cool weather they actually become a little bit tastier their sugars increase and it gives it gives those brussels sprouts a i don't want to say better taste but sweeter sweeter yeah like you know and kale kale is the hearty one here it can go down to uh what temperatures of about 10 degrees uh, but not all kale. Certain varieties of kale can handle much colder temperatures. Yeah. Um, so typically like a dinosaur kale, um, la siento kale, and then ornamental kale, all of those will survive to about 10 degrees. And we, I mean, I remember we saw this. We had that one, geez, it was probably like 10 years ago now. We had that really warm winter and our neighbor had some ornamental kale. Which is edible. And which is edible. Um, and it did last a, a long time. Right. Yeah. Now, with any of those kales, cabbages, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, they do go to seed the second year if you allow them to be left alone. And even on a mild winter, you want to harvest as much as possible. And it's not so much you're growing it during the cold portions, it's you're sustaining the life of it. So it's basically... As best as it can be. You're keeping it chilled outside in the natural refrigerator of nature. And then when you're ready to harvest, then you can harvest it, bring it in. You're not trying to harvest it, keep it in the fridge for three, eight weeks or whatever the case is. And then we all know how that ends up. Uh, in some instances, instances, you try to guess what that once was in the refrigerator. Now let's talk about root crops. Carrots, for example, here. We can overwinter those in the garden. By covering them, and this would be the same for parsnips or turnips or rutabagas as well. Right. So um, so if you're going to do this, whatever carrots that you might want to, you might want to use for food preservation, you want to harvest those. But if you have, because you want to harvest those, that their freshness, so whether it be like you're making a canning of soup. um, Pressure canning. Pressure canning of soup, pressure canning just carrots, whatever. You want to harvest those directly. You don't want to can the carrots that, that have been sitting in the soil. So the ones that have been in sitting in the soil, those are your your grocery store carrots, uh, meaning uh, that you yeah. can go out and harvest when you want. And it, I, I believe that there was, this was a technique that was is and is used by the Amish. They'll take a patch. Let's say it's the size of your uh, queen size bed. <clears throat> There's carrots there. They will mound six, eight feet of leaves on top of that. It'll keep the carrots in the soil frigid, but it will not, it will not allow it to freeze. And then as they're wanting to harvest, 
then they can go ahead and remove those leaves. The soil is frigid, but still uh, diggable or workable in order to remove the carrots. This is also a very great way to utilize if you've got a Jerusalem artichoke patch where they have a very short shelf life or sun chokes is what some people will label them as. Uh, you can trim back the top portion of them so it kind of, you know, knock that down. And then you can mound leaves on top of those, that bed. And that way you can harvest them through the winter months. Uh, in the northern portions here of the United States where we're located and many of you are, when it gets cold, it doesn't mess around. It gets cold and it stays that way for months on end. Uh, so we want to be as prepared as possible. Uh, because, you know, you can bring carrots in, pack them in sawdust or sand and preserve them that way in the basement or a root cellar or in a chilled area of the house. But if you can leave them actually in the physical ground, that's the best way to preserve them is by leaving them where they naturally grow. Right. Yep. So that is definitely an option. Um, and, and let's not let's say we don't have leaves available to mound over these items. What are some other alternatives in which we can use? You can use straw, so you can just go to your local garden center or find like, the fall <laughs> festival parties on November first, <laughs> and a lot of those straw bells are kicked to the side of the road uh, after the fall decorations have been removed, and then they move into the next holiday, which I believe which would be Thanksgiving. So that's a great way to find straw bells for a straw bell garden. You still have to condition those in the spring, but you can place them in the position in which they're going to be next spring. And you can also utilize those as mulch uh, to preserve and protect the plants in which you're trying to leave outside and uh, keep them safe and warm. Right. So you can you can use those straw bales, and they are that is useful. Um, Straw bale, like straw or leaves is probably your best bet for covering up Mm -hmm. carrots. I don't really know what else you would use. That would be about all, yeah. yeah. Uh, I wouldn't use like wood chips or anything like that because those will freeze it, but you want something loose, fluffy, light, won't blow away, but yet still will hold that insulation. It's like an insulation that you're protecting the the soil uh, with in that. Uh, any anything else that we're missing here in, our, in the short amount of time that we're able to talk about the overwintering of plants? Um, no, but you can also, if you have perennial plants, whether that be um, some sort of uh, flower or shrub or what have you, um, at this point you would have to think about um, maintenance or care for right. that, and that would be like whatever that looks like, harvesting bulbs, moving bulbs, planting bulbs, things like that. People tend to do that in the fall. Right. And if you're concerned about, you know, if you've got, you know, a a tender plant, typically uh, you would have that in a container and you would move it into a garage or a a, a protected area. Uh, And that's why we always recommend if you're going to buy, you know, fancy plants, I guess that's what you would call these tropical plants, you would want to have some place where you can physically bring them in so you're not repurchasing them the next growing season and then if you do decide to grow a plant a bush a shrub a flower uh whatever that case is in your growing in your backyard you want to look at the growing zone that those things are listed for that's why that label is there if it can withstand growing temperature or uh, growing zone uh three to eight and you're in zone four then you're probably okay but if you're in zone four and it's rated for four, about every five years, you're probably going to have to repurchase that plant because there's going to be a cold snap that comes through that's going to, to, to ruin that plant. Just, you always want to go, you always want to have the, the growing zone being one colder than where you're at to have a better success on whatever that particular item is that you're putting in your property, uh, for beauty or for production. Well, um, thank you for taking your time out of your day to listen to our show. This is our 25th, 25th show, 2020. Did you miss last week's show? We talked about how not all weeds are bad and all about pressure canning. We also had author Sandra Smith. You can listen to that show by going to your favorite podcast platform and searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast 
or we'll make it even easier to find them. Send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com in the subject line, put show 24, and we'll send you the link. We'll be right back. We'll be talking about many near soil for spring. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, a program to help you grow a better garden, maintain your landscape, help your trees grow better, make that grass look greener, and preserving what you grow for indoor and out. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Trees look sad. When we here at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardens have a tree or shrub issue, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil. So you can grow stronger plants, chemical-free, environmentally responsible fertilizer that works. It will put a smile on your face and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The new way to support your tomatoes, wrap it and snap it, tomatosnaps.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center offers an awesome selection of high-quality garden and landscape products. We have just the plants you're looking for. Annuals, perennials, veggies, herbs, and more. Plus, you can always count on us to answer all of your questions and offer expert advice. Blue Mel's also carries the largest selection of bulk landscape materials in the area. Enjoy a beverage from our coffee shop while your kids run around in our huge playground. Join our growing list of highly satisfied customers. Visit the garden center that offers everything you're looking for. Visit Blue Mel's today. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Power Planter Earth Augers, Ivy Organics, Root Maker, Pomona Universal Pectin, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Pro Plugger, Tomato Snaps, World's Coolest Floating Rain Gauge. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Thank you for hanging around with us. We're going to talk about amending your soil. Well, first, we're going to talk about how do you know if you need to amend your soil and then what to do in order to amend your soil, Holly. Well, you typically will know if you need to amend your soil is if you are having problems, whether that be something like um, your plants are looking yellow or you're not getting enough fruit or your roots are sad. Or the soil is very, very densely compacted and the it's difficult to keep the soil hydrated uh, because it's cracking so much because there's not enough organic material in it. The, the You water the plants and all your plants are still looking stressed because they can't absorb that water because the water won't. You know, the soil is almost hydrophobic, which is it's repelling the water because there's not enough material inside of it in order to uh, absorb that moisture. Right. So those are definite, definite signs. Um, and so you want to, 
you want to add something to your soil, which would be the amending part. And we've done this um, in our in our before we had raised beds. We did this in our ground garden. We will do this with our with right. the raised beds as well. Right. But um, I remember one time you went through and you dug. Down like two feet. Double dig. Double dig. Yeah. That's what it was. Yeah. That's not, not, that's not, not amending. That's not amending and it's kind of not recommended based on what uh, author you read. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it double digging, yeah, you remove the top foot and then you dig down another foot and then you loosen that up and you throw the top so- top foot back on top of it. So, uh, okay. So let's say we, we know we need to amend the soil because we have all the telltale signs. The plants are stressed. It's not absorbing the water as as it should, like, you know, good compost wood. It's kind of rolling off. You see that there's a lot of cracks in the soil, um, a lot of different things, that are, and the plants are not as strong or as vibrant in color as they should be. So some people may decide or may think, okay, I'll just go in there, pull the plants out, and till that soil to loosen it up. That's not necessarily the answer to the solution because, yeah, you're going to loosen the soil up now, but it's going to be back the same way. You haven't added anything to it. You've just fluffed it. And once it rains and the winter occurs and everything, and, and, and you don't cover it over the winter, it's going to get weathered again. It's going to get compacted again. So we need to add something to it. Some people will uh, add what, Holly? So you can add your own compost. Say you have compost that you've composted. <laughs> that would be what you would do. You can. Well, here's the other. If you've done your own compost mm-hmm. and you're going to add it to your garden, is it a hot compost, which would probably have killed most of your weed seeds, or is it a cold compost, which just naturally broke down the materials but didn't kill the viability of those seeds off? So if you was to introduce it back into your garden, raised beds or containers or ground, you're basically planting new weed seeds for your garden. Right. And so that is something to keep in mind is that if you are cold composting, you don't want to amend your soil with this because you could introduce the the weeds. You will. You will. You will, <laughs> you yeah, will you introduce. Will. Um, but if you are hot composting, then that's okay. So you can add your own compost. You can add aged manure. And can you explain aged manure? Aged manure is the animal has kicked it out the back end and it sat there for six or eight or 12 months and it went from manure to compost to a soil consistency now based on the type of animal based on the type of manure you can add fresh manure from some animals other animals you have to wait for it to completely age now if you're getting your compost from your own animals uh, many of you are in areas where that is very very accessible uh, you still want to be aware of what the animal has consumed because if they have or you have sprayed your fields, or you have hay or grasses that has been sprayed with a persistent herbicide, and that persistent herbicide kills everything except for the grasses, it is, and the animal eats it, which the animal is not affected by that herbicide, it goes to the animal, goes through the back end and into the compost pile and breaks down, and in eight months you've got beautiful black compost. However, that persistent herbicide is so potent that it is still active even in the soil form that kills your broadleaf plants. Same as weed and feed in your yard with the grass clippings. You take that compost, which looks beautiful, put it in your garden, and your tomato plants, your beans, your potatoes all start getting deformed because that active uh, persistent herbicide is so potent that it's altering and and messing it up and it's killing your plants. So you want to be aware of the whole realm of where the grass came from, what the animal ate, and, and all this stuff. Uh, Joe Lample, host of PBS's Growing a Greener World, he's been a guest on this program multiple times, and we've talked about, it's called uh, Killer Compost. And if you want to know more details, and he did an episode on this on his PBS program about uh, Killer Compost, and he put it in his raised beds, he saw the effect of it, and then had to remitigate the soil over a period of time, doing naturally, and it was a very uh, eye-opening experience. He knew what this was, and he knew it could happen, but he was very eager in order to get his raised beds filled. So he went ahead and used this compost, which was the manure that was the grass, and uh, had a had a problem. And it took him a couple of years in order to get it back where it should have been beforehand. So you want to know the source. So if you're going to go uh, with that, uh, be aware of the source. 
Um, we're, we we like to use plant based compost if we purchase a compost, uh, simply because we know that there's a much like uh, less likely chance that there's going to be an issue with it. We don't have to worry necessarily about the herbicides. It's just, it's yeah. just what we prefer, yeah. and that's okay. But we want to make yeah. you aware that and this people, does exist. Well, yeah, and some people have animal compost readily available. And use it up. And use it up, right? Like, But it's got to be aged, otherwise yeah. it will burn the plants. Even, now, if, even if they haven't ate any you know, grasses like we just explained. Right. You've got to let it turn into soil before you can use it. Otherwise, you're, you might as well just hit the garden with a blowtorch because that's what's going to happen. They're going to, it's going to be so high, tr- high nitrogen that it's going to almost kill your plants, if not kill them. Right. Um, so you can add, and then also the plant base is a lot of times like leaf or um, like organic matter, whatever, if it's a, a plant based compost, you can add leaves. So your trees around you are giving off these amazing, free, free awesome resource, which are the leaves. And you can add those to your soil. They are so beneficial for your soil. They break down. We use them as mulch. We just love leaves. So, and did um, we say they're free? They're free. They're free. Free. Yes. Uh-huh. A- and and if your neighbors have done their planting right, uh, the wind will kindly blow them into your yard, and that'll save a lot of work from going over there and, and picking them out of their yard because we've done that. We've we're not above that. Yeah. No. Uh, when it's free <laughs> and it's just a few extra, it's like getting a. Uh, a small with free refills. Uh, a small with free refills is really a large with just a little extra walking. That's like your favorite yep. thing to say yep. sometimes. Okay, so you can add leaves. You can also add, and I would also add, coffee grounds. Now you say, whoa, 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 how much coffee are you drinking? And I don't know how if things have changed. You'd have to call your local coffee shop to find out. But with, um, you know, distancing, what have you. But they should be able to still provide you in coffee. In the past. Grounds. In the past. Um, you can go to your local coffee shop. You call ahead and you say, you know, I'm, I, I would like some coffee grounds for my garden. Can I bring you a bucket? And a lot of times if you're willing to bring them a bucket, they're willing to hook you up with some coffee grounds. And you can incorporate the filters into that coffee, uh, into the into the beds as well. You don't have to remove the coffee filters uh, just dump them all in. You can also use it in your compost pile. It's considered a green material, um, and it works very, very well. I mean, I go through like five pounds of coffee a month, but that's not. I don't think that's enough to fill up a five gallon. Bucket. And you want to work the work it into the soil because if you just throw it on top, yeah, it's an organic matter, but it loses the two percent available nitrogen that it contains, and you really want to get all the benefits that you possibly can out of the coffee. Uh, grounds, the used coffee grounds. Right. Doesn't make your soil acidic because that's been brewed out, so don't worry about that. Uh, just go ahead and mix it in your soil. Yep. So, yeah. Um, now, if you're having issues and you're not sure what the issue is and you want to get a soil test, we would highly recommend that. Soil tests will, will tell you, you know, what the issue is, what, what, what you're missing, whatever, and then you could amend your soil. What you're way. missing or what you have too much of, a surplus. It will break down the details of what's going on beneath the soil because you can't look at, it, at the soil and go, well, that tomato plant is showing that. It get, kind of gives you a little guideline, but you can't go, well, I've got X percent of this and that. You have to get a soil test. Use signs to our advantage here and see what is actually going on. So you can make fewer moves, make them count, and get the most out of what the garden can provide for you. Right. So that is definitely something that... You'd want to look into. And uh, what are some problems that you may be having? Well, we just covered a bunch of them here. So uh, don't just assume that, oh, it's just an off year. It'll get better next year because that doesn't work. It, uh, never have we ever gardened and, go and said, well, it didn't work out this good this year. Next year it'll be better. And next year was better. And we didn't do anything. That's that's not that's how never that happened. No, it's no. never happened. No. No, so uh, you've got to make a move, and you got to make the right move, and it's the only way to make the right move is to have the right information, and a soil test will provide that uh, to know what, how much nitrogen you need to add, or how much potassium you got too much of, or whatever the case is. Um, definitely make it worth your effort if you're going to put all this time and effort into the garden. Work at it, and make sure you can do the right moves and, and make the most out of it. And making the right moves, well, Japanese beetles have made their move into your garden and are devastating everything that you got from flowers to pole beans and uh, as well as 
beetles and weevils and boars, but they're all led uh, by the Pied Piper, which is those Japanese beetles. Right, and you want to control them as as much as possible and quickly, and you can use Grub Gone to do so. It's an easy-to-apply granular product that can be spread on your turf to successfully control grub invaders. Developed by Phylum Bioproducts from a naturally occurring bacteria, Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT product that specifically targets only scare pests and is safe to use around bees and other beneficial insects. The Japanese beetles are flying around, so take them down with orga- with Beetle Gone, the organic water dispersible powder you can spray directly on your edible plants with zero days to harvest, and it's all natural. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. What is that address? That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. And you will have a happier garden. Do not go anywhere. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Seed expert Ben Coney will be with us right after this. Vegetable Gardener's phone lines are always jammed during the show. So Joey and Holly keep their phone lines open 24-7 to help you. Call anytime, 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-7469. Or just remember, 1-800-927-SHOW. S-H-O-W. Leave a message and they will call you back. Planting conditions are always favorable with the Power Planter Earth Auger. No matter what the job is, Power Planter has the right size for you. Simply attach to a drill and let the Power Planter do the work for you, creating holes fast and efficiently with ease. Find the size that fits your project at PowerPlanter.com. For all your indoor growing needs, equipment, and supplies, it's WeGrowIndoors.com. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants. To multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds, RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code TWVG at checkout and get 10% off your entire order. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Phylum Bioproducts, Dr. Jim's, Nasala Kabucha, MI Greenhouse LLC, Green Gobbler, Water Hoop, Seed Savers Exchange. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. What better time than right now to finish up those last minute jobs that you want to complete this summer on your property? There's a place called Blue Mel's Landscape and Garden Center just off of Layton over in Greenfield. They're at 3940 West Loomis Road. You've heard them on this program multiple times because they support what we do, and we support what they do. They've got 40 varieties of bulk material, largest in the area in which you can choose from. You can go pick it up if you have the proper equipment, or you can have it delivered right to your job site or your garden. They've got compost. They've got wood chips, sand, gravel, and everything in between to make your property look the best it possibly can. Blue Mail's Landscape and Garden Center at 4930 West Loomis Road, just off of Layton and Greenfield. Give them a call at 414-282-4220. And visit them online at bluemels.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Let's go to the hotline, Holly, and bring in our guest for this week. Ben Cohen is an author, herbalist, gardener, seed saver, educator, and owner of Small House Farm in Michigan. He offers workshops and lectures across the country on the benefits of living closer to the land through seeds, herbs, and locally grown food. And he's published numerous works on these topics, including the best-selling Saving Our Seeds and his highly anticipated book, The Artist and Herbalist, which will be coming out spring of 2021. And it's already on pre-order. He serves on the board of the International Herb Association and the Advisory Council for the Community Seed Network. Learn more about Cohen's work at his website at smallhousefarm.com. Welcome to the program, Ben. 
Joey and Holly, thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your obviously very, uh, very uh, busy schedule to join not only Holly and myself but all of our listeners across the country. We're going to uh, you're going to educate uh, us not, uh, and our listeners on some things here. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I really appreciate you guys inviting me on. You're welcome. Now, saving seeds is an important practice for the home gardener. Why why are saving seeds so important from your own garden? And also, um, why would you encourage people to do so? Well, you know, I save seeds from our garden for a variety of reasons, and they're all reasons that I would encourage others to do it as well. You know, we could think of it as simple economics. You know, it's less expensive to save my own seeds than to purchase them every year. Um, these seeds that I save in my own garden are locally adapted to, to produce better, perform better right here in my own garden. Every time I buy seeds, it's kind of like pushing the reset button and starting over with seeds that are coming from, oh, who knows where they even come from sometimes. You know, these locally adapted seeds are going to perform so much better. We could talk about genetic preservation. We could talk about the history of our heirloom seeds. You know, every one of these seeds that we pass down throughout the generations, these heirlooms, they're filled with stories and, and the history and culture of all these people. Uh, everyone that's everyone that's grown the seed before us has their fingerprints on it in a way. That's powerful, you know. Um the sense of community. I think that's my number one, though, Holly. When when we get together to, to save and share our seeds amongst our communities, that's a powerful thing that we can do. You know, just this last spring, there was such a rush on seeds. Everybody was buying seeds. We, we were really unsure about our future, you know. And, and and we sell seeds on our website. We have a we have a retail platform on our small house farm website where we sell seeds that we grow here. And we sold more seeds this spring than we sold in all the years that we've been in business. It, it was amazing. And, and to me, that was such a sign of why it's so important for gardeners to practice saving their own seeds. That ensures food security, and that's the most important reason of all. Well, if you save the seeds, let's say, from a leaf lettuce, a romaine lettuce plant, there's enough seeds on there to small uh, feed a small town, uh, hundreds of thousands of seeds, it seems like, just on one plant. So, it, and it doesn't take a lot of effort either. You, there's a lot, you know, the internet's on computers now. You can find a lot of stuff very quickly that is, you know, accurate on how to do these things, uh, that are very simple. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the example that you use as a lettuce, that's a wonderful example. If we think about that, you know, we plant one seed to produce the lettuce, but that one plant will produce 30, 40, 50 flowers, and each flower will have 12 to 16 seeds. Now, you can do the math on that, Joe, if you want, but that is exponential, right? Just a handful of seeds becomes hundreds of seeds so quickly, um, and, and, and it is. The resources on the Internet make it so it's something that anybody, everybody can do. Now, with that same passion, your latest book, Saving Our Seeds, um, tell us what it is about, what inspired it, and what is something notable our listeners may be interested in for purchasing it. Well, sure. Now, Saving Our Seeds is this, the second book about seed saving that we've published. Um, this one, it really starts out as a how-to guide, right? It will walk you through all the technical aspects of how to harvest, process, and store seeds from 43 different species. So it's, it's pretty comprehensive in that aspect. But as a seed saver, I'm also a storyteller. So throughout the pages, it's filled with stories of my own experiences, in the gardens or with seeds that I've saved, but also I've brought in a number of contributors, seed savers from around the country that have shared their stories about why they save seeds and why seed saving is so important to them. Well, yeah, absolutely. Now, you're an herbalist. What is an herbalist? Because some people may hear that and think of the special plant that you uh, smoke. <laughs> uh, but what what is the significance of being an herbalist, and, and what is the actual classification or the definition of, of what you consider yourself being an herbalist? Oh, sure. Now, so I guess the first thing that comes to mind, well, for me, I, I see what's the first thing that you think of, Joey, but for me, the first thing I think of, I suppose, an herbalist is somebody that maybe works with plants to produce medicine or uh, beauty and wellness products, right? Or we can think of maybe a culinary herbalist, um, somebody that uses herbs to highlight the nutrition and flavor of the food that they produce. Um, but I think really at the core of it all, an herbalist is somebody who has a relationship with the plants that they grow. Right. They, they understand the plants that they grow to such a point that they can harness the, these, these benefits that the plants offer to us, and they can work hand-in-hand hand with these plants to create wonderful things to share with themselves, their families, and their communities. And I guess an herbalist is kind of like a modern-day farmer. There's fewer and fewer and fewer and far between 
compared to 50, 100 years ago. Oh, you're right. You know, Mother Nature provides for our every need. Underneath every footstep is everything that we need. And we just need to learn to listen to Mother Nature's voice and maybe hear it a little bit differently. And she, she's telling us everything that we need to know. Um, everything that we may need in this life, Mother Nature provides it. And the herbalist maybe translates that language a little bit to the consumer to help them see the benefits of what she has to offer. Well, true. I'm not a doctor. Holly doesn't claim to be one either. But I've always said whatever the body eel, uh, is sickened from, there's something in nature that has been provided to heal the body. That's a fact. Definitely. Now, we are talking with Ben Cohen or Bevan Cohen um, from he's an author and from smallhousefarm.com. Now, people hear sustainable living and have misconceptions about it. What does it mean to you? Can people practice it on any level, no matter where they live? This is a great question, Holly. I love this question. Now, sustainability is such a uh, an important topic, but one that there is so much misconception around. Now, I would have to say that to me, sustainability is maybe producing more and consuming less, right? If we focus on our lives, if we take a moment to kind of analyze how we go about our day and we think about how much we consume, how much we use, how much we take from the system, and if, if we are honest with ourselves and make more responsible choices and opposed to taking so much, maybe we try to give back a little bit more. Maybe we try to produce more than we consume. You know, I think that that creates a more sustainable environment, right? Now, sustainable, do we want to sustain where we're at right now? Do we want to just stay at this level or do we want to grow beyond that? I think perhaps we'd like to grow beyond that, but you know, baby steps. And this is something that everybody can do. Anybody everywhere can make more sustainable decisions. We could think about it like if you're in a situation where you're able to maybe uh, use public transportation or ride a bicycle instead of driving to work every day. Right. That's that's a good way to con- conserve our resources. Maybe um, shopping more locally. Meet one of your local farmers. Take a moment to, to get some locally produced food that doesn't have to travel as far. Or we can take it one step further. And I think that your listeners may be already into this, growing a little bit of their own food. Right. Even if we have a limited space, even just a balcony. Right. Planting some seeds and producing just a little bit of our own food. These these little steps are large achievements towards a more sustainable life. Well, and you bring up that important part, baby steps. Yeah, you can get overwhelmed by anything if you look at the, you know, the the whole picture, you see the forest from the trees, but you take a little chunk at a time and then you start getting then you look behind you and see what you've accomplished and then you can you get more um self-motivation and then you're like, "Okay, I can get this. I I can accomplish this." It was overwhelming because I was looking too big. I got to look at one step in, at a time. Right. And, you know, a few small steps added together, that becomes quite a leap, you know. And if all of us just take a couple small steps, uh, the impact that that can have on such a large scale is very powerful. So, yeah, every little bit, even the smallest changes that we can make are powerful changes, certainly. Definitely. Now, you have a a farm or a small homestead, homestead called Small House Farm. Where did this idea come from? Is this something that you've always lived on a homestead life? Um, you know, with your spouse, like Joey and I, was this a team idea? How did this all come about? Sure. Now we've been here at small house. It's less than a decade, you know? Um, and before, before we came here, we lived very busy, busy corporate lives. You know, I, I worked, um, I worked a lot, you know, nine to five style work and as as did my wife and you know small house was really an effort to to simplify things to to slow down a little bit to kind of step away from the hustle and bustle and 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 learn to appreciate all of the small moments you know and it's really kind of taken on a life of its own small house has kind of led us to where we are on its own really we just had to kind of step out of the way and and let nature take her course in a way um, so no, as a little kid, I grew up in a, in a little apartment with my grandmother. Um, you know, I was out there on my balcony planting radishes in a little pot. That was my gardening experience as a kid, you know? So to get to where we're at right now was really a 180, but we got there with all those baby steps, little incremental changes over time is what led us to small house. Um, and you know, my wife and I, we are a team the, we, we make decisions together. We, we, that's very important to how things work here. Um, she is, I always say she's the most patient woman on the planet. I mean, cause she's got to put up with me all day. She is my rock. Um, you know, I'm kind of head in the clouds. I'm the dreamer. 
and she's the one that keeps us grounded in reality. And we make such a good team. It's a perfect yin and yang. You know, I'm really blessed to have Heather in my life. And, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's just really been an awesome thing to be able to kind of just pull out, step back and, and, and see the world for what it is. And now that we have, you know, our children here, we get to, that's the most magical part of it, guys, um, is being able to pass this onto them and to see the joy in their faces when we're out harvesting plants out of the woods and they can identify these different plants and they know what they're good for. That's powerful stuff. Those, those steps forward are some of the most important things that I can do is passing this on to my children. So, you know, um, thank goodness we make such a good team. Really. Absolutely. Now, before I ask you how we can find out more about you, I want to go back to whenever you were a kid on the balcony planting radishes. Was your grandmother encouraging you or just let you do your own thing because you, you stayed out of her hair because you're on the balcony playing in dirt? <laughs> Maybe a little bit of both, okay. right? All right. Uh, but, you know, she was encouraging of it. She thought it was cute. Um, and, and when I did have some radishes that did well for me, she made a big point of, you know, they would be part of the salad that night. And, right. You know, and I grew those radishes. So she was encouraging of it for sure. Um, as much, as much as she could be with what we had available to us. Well, how can listeners find out more about you? Where can they get your, per, your current book and how can they pre-order the new book? Well, you know, the easiest way to get a hold of me is via our website, smallhousefarm.com. Um, you can also find us in social media, the Facebooks and, uh, Instagram. We have a YouTube channel, Small House Farm. You can find us there for lots of videos about the things that we're doing out here at the farm. And if anybody's interested in pre-ordering the new book, they can find that very easily at theartisanherbalist.com. Well, Ben, we greatly appreciate the knowledge that you have shared with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners and the time that you've granted to us. Joey and Holly, I loved being on the show. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And when we come back, it's going to be about your garden questions, our garden answers, to the top of the hour. You're listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Trimbin turns any chair into a workstation. Comfortably sort your herbs, dried flowers, cannabis, and more. Easily collect pollen with a static brush and mirror finish collection tray. High walls keep your work contained. To get yours, visit harvest-more.com. Made in California. Do not go anywhere. There is more of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show to come, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool. To find the right size for your digging project, visit powerplanter.com. World's coolest rain gauge.com. Need I say more? Looking to kill weeds without using dangerous chemicals like glyphosate? An all-natural weed killer may be just what you're looking for. Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is a concentrated herbicide derived naturally from corn. It's four times stronger than regular table vinegar, so it packs a punch against all kinds of pesky weeds. Use Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer to safely kill dandelions, crabgrass, clover, ivy, and more. It's perfect for driveways, pavers, fence lines, and other outdoor surfaces. Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer is an effective and powerful herbicide, but it doesn't stop there. It's also certified for organic use, so when used properly, it won't negatively affect soil or water. Wildlife. Since Green Gobbler's Vinegar Weed Killer is pure vinegar with no other additives, pet owners can let their pets out to play right after application. Search for Green Gobbler Vinegar Weed Killer on Amazon.com today. We offer a hassle-free money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. When it comes to bulk landscaping materials, Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center is where everyone goes. Whatever the project, we have the materials you need with over 40 varieties to choose from. Soils, mulches, gravels, decorative stones, fresh cut sod. Blue Mills has these products in stock and ready for easy pickup or fast delivery. So what are you waiting for? Now is the time to get your yard back into shape. Stop in and pick these materials up or call us for delivery today. Nobody does bulk landscaping materials better than Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Neptune Harvest, Happy Leaf LED, Drip Works, We Grow Indoors, Deer Defeat, Harvest More, Blue Ribbon Organics, Blue Mills Landscape and Garden Center, Chip Drop. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. 
Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, which is presented to you by Power Planter Earth Augers, the official digging tool to find the right size for your digging project. Visit PowerPlanter.com. Now here are your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Welcome back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Your questions to the top of the hour. You got a question, you can give it. Get to us. Get that question to us. A couple of ways. You can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can jam your fingers on the phone and dial 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. And that will connect you with us. If we can't get to you, leave a message. We will call you back with the answer to your question. Holly, we had a couple of canning questions come in this week. And the first one is... Is it safe to reprocess in a hot water bath jars that did not seal? And if so, how is the correct way to go about doing such? Yep. So you want you can do this about a day after, within a day after of those jars not sealing. Um, so if you so, say it's like Sunday afternoon, and you've made a batch of pickles, you made a batch of pickles, twelve of the four. I want to uh, pickles are kind of weird. Oh. Let's say salsa. Okay, salsa. So you you've, you've canned eighteen jars of salsa. And all but four sealed. So you got four the next morning, clink, clink, clink. They didn't seal. Now what, what, what do we do now? So what you do now is you get new lids. Lids? Yeah, lids. That's the you flat get, piece. You get new lids. Make sure you do wipe off the rims and, and whatnot. Um, and then what you do is you put them in your canner, but you don't have the canner boiling. So you put them in the canner. You bring the water up to boil with the jars in there. And then... You just time it like you normally. So, so water's in the canner at room temperature. The jars room are temperature. room temperature. You've put a new flat piece in, new new lid on that flat piece. We don't do that before you put them. Put them in there. Yeah. So then you turn the water on, <laughs> and then everything is coming to temperature at the same time. Correct. When the boiling occurs, that's when the timer would it starts in the normal procedure that you were doing the previous day. If it takes fifteen minutes, when the boiling water starts to boil, that's when you start that fifteen minute timer. And do the normal procedure, wait until that time is up based on the, the recipe, pull the jars out, and then you should hear, you know, then they should seal. Right. What is some of the reasons why a jar may not seal? What it, what it can, times, what can be a contributing factor there? A lot of times it can be, um, it can be your, your, uh, rims are not. Rings. Ri- no, your rims. Uh, the rims the of the rim jar. The jar uh-huh. is not clear or not dry or whatever. Um, could have a chip in it too. Could have a chip in it, yep. Um, that's basically the only reason. If you, if you bought lids and you continue to have issue, this issue, definitely call the manufacturer. Well, don't throw the box away because these boxes have numbers on them, right. batch numbers, which this is very important because that's what the information they're going to require. What is the batch number on the lids? And right, they yeah. can trace it back. Uh, in regards to that, we had another question come in. How long can our unused canning lids, the flat ones, good for? It's about five years. So there's a, I don't know if it's rubber or plastic or whatever. It's that, a gasket. It's a gasket deal. If you look at your lids, you'll see it's like, I don't know, orange, brownish. Um, just like anything else that's rubbery, plasticky, it's going to eventually lose its suppleness. So five years is, is the approximation. I mean, if you find, we found, remember those old uh-huh. lids we found at a rummage sale? We didn't right. use those. We used the rings. Right. But those were probably like from, I don't know, the 80s or something. Um, I mean, you can take a gamble, but you're just going to end up frustrating yourself. So I would Spend say Spend the $4 years. or whatever yeah. cost and, and buy the fresh ring. Use the old ones for dry storage. You can certainly use the ones that are, you know, over five years old if you've got a bunch of those for, for dry storage or whatever. And, you can, and, or freezer. And Free- canning stuff is like everywhere right now. Right. It's at the hardware store. It's at the grocery it's, store. It's a hot it's item at, right now. Yeah, it's at like big box stores. So um, definitely there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to find canning lids. Um, so Brand, oh, we have a comment. Brandon oh. writes in referring to our show, um, a, a topic in t- episode 22, Lessons We Have Learned. He said, very humble of you guys to share a lesson learned even at your expert level. No answer needed, just a compliment. So thank you, Brandon. Well, you know, we want to help you. We, you know, it's 
there, there's a lot of things that, you know, you watch on TV and, you know, there's never a mistake made because they've got 22 minutes and that's what they've got to do in order to get the TV show produced. And if it's, if it's the Brandon that is always following us. Brandon out of Philadelphia. I think yep. that's, yep, yep, yep. So thank you, Brandon. We appreciate your, your loyalty to us as well. But yeah, we want to show our mistakes because if we made them, you probably will make them. So we want to really try to prevent you. Let, let us make the mistakes and let us tell you the mistakes. So you don't have to make them so your first time can be a success and you don't have to get frustrated like we have uh, doing the things that uh, we did wrong. Uh, let's see here. I've got a lot of daff, a lot of tulips and daffodils and they are all uh, and other spring sprouting plants in grass. If I was to go over my grass with a weed killer, would that kill my tulips and dandelion or t- tulips and, and daffodils? Uh, that are under the ground. They've not come up. They're under the ground. Uh, can I use a weed killer for that? Well, it may not kill the bulbs directly. However, if you use something that has glyphosate in it, which is Roundup, um, weed killer, then they, this chemical can stay in the soil. It's a persistent herbicide, so it can be picked up by the bulbs. It could cause them to be deformed. It could cause them to be killed. Um, you could do a vinegar weed killer instead. Right. It's going to, with a vinegar weed killer, it, it's not, it, the glyphosate weed killer, and there's a bunch of different brands out there, uh, it's designed to absorb into the leaf and go right to the root and kill it from the root system. Uh, vinegar weed killers, uh, whether homemade or, or commercially bought, it burns the leaves of the plant. So you do a uh, initial burn, which is called a top burn, and then you come back a few days later and you you uh, apply it again, and you have you reapply it, uh, you know, sometimes two or three times, in order to kill the plant back. That doesn't mean it's killed the roots; it's just killed the top foliage, foliage of the plant. And then, if you stress the plant out enough, it will not be able to regenerate because that greenness is the photosynthesis capabilities of feeding the roots. So, uh, you just be aware of that whenever you're using any type of weed killer. Okay. Um, so another question is, is will the stump of the Brussels sprout plant grow to another stalk or do you have to plant a new one? Um, you have to plant a new one. If you leave the Brussels sprout plant alone this fall, then in the spring it will start, it will start to develop seeds on it. However, if you remove all the sprouts of the plant, uh, the likelihood of that plant coming back, uh, is still a probability because it may produce some seeds, but it's not going to produce the sprouts on it like it did this year uh, on what you harvested. So uh, just better to plant a new one in the spring. Uh, flea beetle. Uh, are, uh, what is a good way to deal with flea beetles? So flea beetles are more active in spring when the adults emerge and their feeding can damage plants, uh, seedlings especially. So you can use neem oil and other horticultural oils. When you use neem oil, you want to look for the cold-pressed neem oil. It's typically going to be sold in a smaller bottle. If you go to the garden center and they send you this, they sell you this large spray bottle of neem oil, it means that if it's likely lost the neem oil properties. So you want to go to your local f- organic food store or co-op and you can buy neem oil directly there. Keep in mind, it, uh, smells, it, terrible. it smells terrible. <laughs> uh, we used it for um, our, our lime tree. We, well, we had dwarf lime tree. Dwarf lime tree yeah. it had gotten scale. Yep, scale. And it, I, I think it kind of worked, but I think it was like far, our poor lime tree was far past gone. Right. But it smells like rubber tires and rotten eggs. Um, so like burnt rubber tires. But if you use it outside, you're not going to have a problem. I mean, it it didn't, it it didn't reek for days on end. It was just an initial, you know. But here's the thing. Okay. So if you buy, you're going to go, you're going to go to the, the food store, organic food store, whatever, or a health store, whatever. And you're going to be like, how much is this neem oil? But you're diluting it. So you're putting like a tablespoon into a gallon of water. Right. But this, this will give you the application that you need. Well, that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of this program, or you can revisit the whole thing if you'd like, and past shows by going to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and clicking on the Season 4 tab at the top of the page. You can also check out Season 1, 2, and 3 tabs while you're there and download podcasts of previous shows. Or you can go and you can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and we will send you the link to this show. 
Tell your garden friends and your garden pals, your garden club, your neighbors that this program's on the air. That's how our message is shared and spread throughout the area. Join us next week on the program when we'll be talking about how you can grow great garlic and tree diseases, what to look for, and then what to do about it once you've identified the problem. And our guest will be terrarium expert Maria Colletti will be with us. And your garden questions. That's all next week on the program. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.